He knew about the storm. He sent us into the storm. So that must be one of the thoughts that has entered into their mind. Why did Jesus send us into a storm that he knew was coming? Immediately he made his disciples to get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, I am. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So, As we began the story last week, we spent all of last Sunday just endeavoring to understand the fundamental, the main point that we're confronted with in the passage. We saw that the story is far, far more than just a story of Jesus rescuing his poor disciples trapped in another storm yet again and doing this with such flair and dramatic fashion by walking to them on the water. Instead, this is a story that is far more than just the the rescue of the disciples. This is a story, as we said last week, of the first theophany, the first great theophany of Mark's gospel. This theophany, this declaration, a proclamation, a revealing of God, this showing of Jesus, of himself, of his deity. Jesus has shown himself from the beginning from the time of his baptism and the dove comes down, the voice from heaven. All of that is declared who Jesus is. But this is this theophany, this particular moment in time in which Jesus shows himself in a particular fashion to a particular group of people. And he shows himself as the great I am. As we saw last week, he does this in a number of ways, three ways in particular. As his disciples are out in this storm at Jesus' command, they did not want to leave. They wanted to stay there with Jesus because they had gotten caught up in the euphoria of the crowd, this crowd that was now clamoring, as we saw from John chapter 6, clamoring for Jesus to now take the political throne. And indeed, they were going to make him king by force. What a crazy thing to think of making someone your ruler against their will. But as we saw last week, this was an insight into our hearts because just as we want rulers to rule over us who have a limited authority, we really are in charge of them. So also the human heart wants a God that we're really in charge of. We have no problem worshiping a God that has power and authority and tells us what to do and we offer to him obedience, but we like for that to go only so far. We like to be the one in the end that's calling the shots, making God in our own image, saying to God this far and no more. And so in the same way, they take Jesus to make him king by force to say, we want to make you king, but we're really the ones who are doing this. But then as the crowd is caught up in this and the, and the disciples become caught up in the crazy euphoria of the crowd, Jesus commands them, get in the boat and go. But we don't want to, Jesus. We want to stay here with you. Get in the boat and leave. Leave now. And so Jesus makes them leave. He compels them to leave. And of course, they leave directly into the storm. Jesus then spends the night praying and then the fourth watch of the night, what would equal uh, our 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. During that time frame, Jesus then comes to them walking on the sea. And so as we saw last week, as he walks to them on the sea, he is fulfilling this motif, this prophecy from the Old Testament that shows again and again, it speaks of God treading on water and putting water under his feet. And so Jesus in this powerful Old Testament image of the God who puts the waters under his feet the waters that are throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, a metaphoric picture of the rule of evil in this world. Jesus puts that under his feet, walks to the disciples. And as he comes to the, 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 to the disciples, we see this enigmatic phrase that he meant to pass them by or, or he wished to pass them by or his purpose was to pass them by. And we saw that that indeed connects in a very specific and solid way to this imagery, this 
phrase that we come across again and again in the Old Testament, when God wishes to reveal Himself to His people, then oftentimes we see this same phrase that He passed them by. We looked at several of the theophanies in the Old Testament and saw this connection. And so Mark is using this phrase in a very specific way for his readers to connect together very specifically Jesus in this moment and God of the Old Testament who wishes to reveal himself to his people. So Jesus wishing to pass them by or in essence to reveal himself to them as God. He then comes to the boat. They're afraid. They think he's a ghost. And he says to them, take heart, take courage. But he doesn't say it is I like our translations often offer to us. He said instead, I am, I am repeating himself. I am, I am taking us back to that great theophany of Exodus three in which we read those words that time in the Hebrew. I am, I am or I am that I am. So Jesus specifically uses this phrase to speak to them. In essence, if we were to translate it literally and directly, we would say Jesus said to them, stop fearing, stop your fearing, take heart, take courage. I am that I am. The great I am is here. Yahweh is here and is now getting in the boat with you. And so getting into the boat after this greatest of theophanies in Mark's gospel, he gets into the boat and the disciples, we are told, were afraid and they did not understand these things because they didn't understand the loaves because their hearts were hardened. They didn't understand the episode, the episode of the loaves where Jesus shows himself as the great shepherd. They didn't understand that because they were caught up in the euphoria of the crowd. They were caught up in this moment of redefining Jesus in their own terms, redefining him to be something more like themselves, something more like their liking or to put it another way, something of a political leader who was here to not only deliver them from the oppression of the Herodians and the oppression of the Romans, but also to empower them. And they had likely visions of sitting on his right hand and sitting on his left hand and visions of of being in court with Jesus and sitting on the throne and having all sorts of power and authority. Being caught up in all of this, they failed to understand the loaves and in such doing their hearts were hardened as we said last week, that, in, that means to us that misperceiving God, they then react to God wrongly. Understanding Him wrongly, they react wrongly. Just as they react wrongly to Jesus, they are terrified of Him because they have, at least for the time being, now misunderstood Him. They have made Him, remade Him, so to speak, in their own image. So that was what we spent our time last week, just endeavoring to understand the mechanics of the passage, what the main point of the passage is. The main point of the passage is that Jesus comes to his disciples as the great I am, as the one who passes by his people, just like the God of the Old Testament passed by Moses in Exodus 33, passed by Elijah in 1 Kings 19. Just just as the God who reveals himself in the Old Testament has said again and again to pass by his people in revelation to them. Jesus also passes by them and says to them, I am that I am is now here. Now, understanding something about the central point of the passage, we now turn to the passage once again, recognizing that the word of God is rich. And the word of God is like the God who wrote it, multidimensional, multifaceted. The word of God is not singular in what it says to us by way of its application. It's singular in what it says to us in its meaning. Its meaning does not have multiple facets, but instead its application often has multiple facets. And so we return this morning because last week we largely skipped over much of the application that is to be found in the passage. So we return to that this morning. And our purpose this morning is just to walk back through the passage and just observe really two, or you could call it three, central applications, or really one. You could really ball this into one application. There are many more that we could make because this this is indeed one of the richest passages in Mark's gospel. So having the ability to make many applications will limit ourselves this morning to really one, or you could call it three, but one central application that we want to look to this morning. We want to turn our thoughts back this morning to this episode on the water. And in turning our, our thoughts back to the episode on this water, We just want to begin by recognizing that the disciples, this is almost goes without saying, but we should begin by saying this, that the disciples were experiencing on this night on the water, they were experiencing something that we could call intense affliction, an intense affliction. We know what affliction means. We know what intense means. We put those together. 
we recognize the fact that we suffer affliction often in our lives, suffering, trials, tribulations. But sometimes those afflictions are slow and long lasting and sometimes they're intense. Sometimes we experience afflictions that might be sharp and pronounced for a period of one or two or three days and then they pass. Sometimes we might experience afflictions that last for years. The disciples are experiencing what we could call an intense, a focused affliction. And it is indeed an affliction because we remind ourselves of the word that Mark uses to describe the waves and their treatment of the disciples. The disciples were, Mark specifically says, tormented or tortured by the waves. So they are experiencing a very intense affliction, a very intense trial. And so the applications that we want to draw from this passage all are going to have to do with our afflictions, and they will have to do very pronouncedly about our intense afflictions, those times in which we experience afflictions in a sharp manner, in a very focused manner, because this is what the disciples are experiencing on this night. So as we set forth on this, I just want to draw a parallel for us, and this parallel I think will begin will help us to begin thinking rightly about the applications from the story. And it's the parallel that we find on another from another story in Scripture that finds a story uh, brought to us of another storm, of a different boat, of a different body of water, of a different time period, but also of a child of God who finds himself in a crisis on the sea, in a storm, for different reasons, but it's a storm, it's on a boat, And that, too, is a story that comes to us with many parallels. And I'm, of course, speaking of the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah is the story of a child of God, not just a child of God, but a specifically selected child of God, a child of God who was raised up and equipped for a specific role, for a specific job, and that's to be prophet. He was a prophet. So he wasn't just a child of God. He was a child of God anointed as the prophet of God. And we know the story how Jonah is told to go to the Ninevites and in his hatred for the ethnicity of the, of the Ninevites, the enemy of God's people, he instead goes the other way and he goes to Tarshish, gets on this boat, going the other direction, and then the storm comes. So many parallels, storm on the sea, the storm is of God's doing. It's a boat, it's a child of God on the boat. There's danger, somebody's going to die or somebody's in danger of dying. But then there's one important contrast that will help us, I think, to begin refining the applications of this story. Because as Jonah, once they woke him up, once he was awake and and he then comes up onto the deck, as Jonah could look out on the waves and see this storm that is battering the boat in which he is now in, he could look out upon those waves and he could say, this storm is here because of my disobedience. I am in this storm, and not only me, but also the sailors on this boat. We are in this storm because I blatantly disobeyed the Lord. In fact, he admits as much when he comes up onto the deck and he even says to them, throw me in the sea. Chapter 1 and verse 12, throw me in the sea and the sea will quiet because it is of me. It is because of me that this great tempest has come upon us all. And then they, of course, throw him in the sea. And just as he said, the sea calms, the storm calms, because God has sent the storm as a result of his disobedience. And he knows that, he recognizes that. So the contrast that we face is that the disciples cannot look out upon this storm of these waves and the sea spray and the, and the wind and the rain. They cannot look about, out upon this storm and say, as Jonah said, that we are in this storm because we didn't listen to God. Oh, if we had just listened to God, we wouldn't be here. If we had just obeyed, if we just weren't so hard-headed, then we wouldn't be here. I wish that I could go back and do this over and, and I would listen to God and I would obey Him and then I wouldn't be in this mess that I'm in right now. Probably many of, you, many of us can relate to episodes in our life in which we could say something very similar to that. I'm in this mess because I failed to obey Because I knew this was wrong and I did it anyway and it has resulted in this crisis of my life, this affliction of my life. Many of us could probably say that. The disciples couldn't. Because they are in this storm specifically because they did obey. Jesus sent them into the storm. Now, they went, at least unwillingly at first, Jesus had to compel them to go, but they went nonetheless. Jesus made His point clear. I want you in the boat and I want you to go to Bethsaida. 
And so then they obey. And because of their obedience, they find themselves in this storm. So perhaps you have been in a similar place as well. Perhaps you could say, I'm in this difficulty. I am confronting this conflict in my life. This unpleasant thing is happening in my life because of my obedience to God. God has asked this of me. God's word teaches me this thing. And so I have done this thing or I have refrained from doing this other thing. And things would have been easier if I'd done this. Maybe it's not so much a sharp affliction, but maybe it's just an unpleasantness. Maybe things would have been easier if you could have skipped on that obedience or told that lie or deceived in that way. Maybe things could have been at least superficially on the short term a little bit easier. So perhaps you can relate to being in a type of a storm as a result of your obedience. That's where the disciples are now. Their obedience to Jesus has has directly placed them into this storm. Now, as I reflect on the times of affliction and trials in my life, you probably are not unlike me. As I think through the trials of my life, I can think of times in which I was in periods of crisis or periods of distress because of disobedience. I can think of times in which things certainly would have been easier. Perhaps things were more difficult because of obedience. But the majority of the times in my life in which I can think of times of afflictions or trials, I either don't know or it's a mixture of both. And maybe you're the same. Maybe you can think back and you can think of particularly sharp trials in your life and you can think, well, I'm not really sure what that was the result of. Or maybe it could have been a little bit of both or either. But you should also, as a child of God, you should also be able to reflect on your life and know of times of difficulty and strain, even trials that resulted from obedience. Because the scriptures tell us in Acts chapter 14, through great tribulation, we will enter the kingdom of God. Or Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he says, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So as children of God, we should have understandings, recollections in our memories of, of experiences in our life in which at the very least life could have been on the short term easier, more pleasant, less unpleasant, had we not been quite so diligent with obedience. Well, if we take that and we ratchet it up a few levels, then that's the disciples on the boat in this evening. They are in the storm because they have obeyed the direct command of Jesus. Now, I got to believe by this point in the story, the disciples are beginning to expect some things from Jesus. They have seen him do so many mighty works and so many wonders, and they've seen him cast out demons and cleanse lepers. They've seen him speak to a storm previously. They've seen some incredible things. But they also have perceived by this point, certainly, that Jesus just seems to know things. You think that they picked up on that, that Jesus just seems to know things. He just seems to know what people are thinking. He just seems to know what the Pharisees are thinking. Indeed, he just seems to know what they're thinking. So Jesus just seems to know things that Normal people just wouldn't know. So don't you think that by this point, especially after spending so many hours on the sea, don't you think that the disciples have put two and two together and they have said to themselves as they are agonizing at the oars, he knew about this storm. Remember when he compelled us, when he was firm with us, he said, get in the boat and go. He knew about the storm. He knew about this. And yet, not only did he send us into the storm, he stayed behind. Don't you think that's going through their minds? He knew about the storm. He sent us into the storm. So that must be one of the thoughts that has entered into their mind. Why did Jesus send us into a storm that he knew was coming? But as their thoughts are certainly in probably just as much turmoil as the water, as their thoughts are tossed and turned this way and that way, one of the things that their thoughts really are not upon, we don't know what the disciples were thinking. We weren't in the boat. We weren't in their, in their brains. We don't know very much about what they were thinking other than just a couple things. We know that, first of all, they were thinking that at first Jesus was a ghost or this phantasma. And then secondly, we know that they were terrified of Jesus when he came into the boat. So we know a couple things there, but we don't know all of their thoughts. But here's what we can rest assured. We can can be fairly certain of the fact that their thoughts are not going to be difficult to discern. 
but not being so difficult to discern, I think that we can have a pretty, pretty high level of confidence of what the disciples were not thinking. And here's what I think that they were not thinking. I don't think that they were thinking anymore about sitting on his right hand and on his left hand. Do you? I think about hour three or four of the storm, they had lost all those thoughts, those, those glossy-eyed, starry thoughts of sitting on Jesus' right hand, and now Jesus is in this position of power, and He's put the Herodians under His feet, and now we are His ministers administering His kingdom for Him. I think all those thoughts have now been placed aside. Because one of the first things that I notice about the story is the tremendous grace and mercy of Jesus to send them into the storm. Let me say that again. The tremendous grace that Jesus shows to them by sending them into the storm. Because one of the things that Jesus just did by sending them into the storm, He has prevented their further sin. He has sent them into the storm, among other reasons, to stop the furtherance of their sin. So let's just think back real quickly to what the problem was with the disciples, why it was that Jesus was so firm with them, why it was that Jesus told them to leave. We're told plainly by both John and the end of the story in Mark's gospel that the disciples here had been caught up in this euphoric excitement of the crowd over this man, Jesus, who has the charisma. He has what it takes. He's got the personality. He's got all this healing stuff going on. He's an incredible teacher. He's got what it takes to be the king that we've been looking for. And the disciples being all caught up in this, this is the reason that Jesus then compelled them to leave. And by compelling them to leave, He then forces them into a situation in which their circumstances caused them to stop sinning in that way, to stop thinking along the lines of of redefining Jesus and His mission, so to speak. Jesus' mission was to seek and to save the lost, not to be some political deliverer. And yet they had begun to reinterpret what His mission was and, and to reinterpret it in a way that was favorable to them in an earthly way, that was going to benefit them in an earthly way. And then reinterpreting this mission of Jesus, Jesus had stopped that sinful line of thinking by sending them into an environment in which their afflictions caused them to be distracted from that in such a way that they cease sinning in that way. 